I was raised in an agnostic atheist home, so I remember very much like mocking Christians saying, oh, you know, we're in the 21st century, just move on. And very much surrounded in Sydney by the LGBTQI plus rights movement and feeling like that was the future. There was the progressive kind of tipping end of Western civilization of finally finding freedom from all this oppression. And I very much imbibed that as a young person. But at the same time, I had this deep spiritual thirst. I ended up having a debate with my uncle at the Christmas lunch table, who's a Pentecostal, white, cisgender, heterosexual, middle-class man. He mentions God. I kind of have a negative reaction to what he said. Although he was very loving towards me, he had this kind of vision of God coming into my life and the Holy Spirit coming coming upon me in three months' time. Exactly three months later, March 2009, I was in a pub in the gay quarter of Sydney, and there's a young filmmaker there who's got her film into the largest short film competition in the world. Everyone was talking about her. I asked her, how did you do this? And she said, well, the real answer is God. And I said, well, you know, I'm gay, and I've read Romans 1, Leviticus 18, all of these scriptures. And she said to me, I have one question for you. Have you experienced the love of God? And then she starts to be kind of touched by the Holy Spirit in front of me in this pub. <laughs> My book is called A War of Loves because it is this war, a war of two definitions of what love really is. I think something about the experience of what happened in that pub has shifted the way I see love quite radically. And so that, I suppose, is what I'm really passionate now about trying to communicate to people that might feel condemned by the church, who might feel confused by the politics. If anyone is watching this and they're not a Christian, but they are a part of the LGBT community, is Christianity good news for them? Another episode of Reenchanting, the podcast brought to you by Seen and Unseen. I am Belle Tyndall. And I'm Justin Briley. And we, together with our guests, we ponder whether this arguably disenchanted world is craving reenchantment and whether it can get that from the mystery and the wonder of the Christian story. Today, we're speaking with David Bennett, who's an author, speaker, and theologian based at Oxford University. Originally from Australia, his 2018 book, A War of Loves, describes his own story of encountering the love of God in a pub in the gay quarter of Sydney. He recounts the story of a life of atheistic gay activism to becoming a follower of Jesus, in which he advocates for a positive moral vision of biblical sexuality and discipleship. Mm, but and before we get into any of that, <laughs> our signature question, and I am so excited to ask it to you because I know you're going to have a good answer. <laughs> what are you reading, David? So I am rereading Ursula Le Guin's The Left Hand of Darkness. Oh, yeah. Which is quality feminist sci fi. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it was a really, you know, I'm rereading it because I read it when I wasn't a Christian. And so I wanted the kind of experience mm. of rereading it now yeah. that I've finished the doctorate and and it's been yeah, it's super, super fascinating. Yeah. Um and then I'm also reading <laughs> Augustine's commentary on one John. Okay. Yes. Sure. I knew this would so, be your answer. You know, I knew yeah. it would be as good as that. <laughs> Amazing. I've got, got a reading group for that this this term at Oxford. So they're the and I, I, I absolutely love, you know, sci fi is actually my favorite. Yeah. Is it? Mm -hmm. Is that an excuse? True sci-fi, not yeah. kind of... What's I'd like, not also true like some fantasy. Well, you know, constructing a world uh, that reflects our own, but sure, isn't sure. this mm, world. Yeah. I love that. Oh. And then the, the reflections that come. Mm. You, you're yeah. in the right city for that yeah. kind of thing, aren't you? With Tolkien and Lewis <laughs> yes, and everyone else yes. who, who's undertaken that. Uh, the doctorate you mentioned, mm -hmm. which obviously you did a lot of reading for, mm -hmm. just remind us what that was specifically on, David. Yeah, so I think the doctorate really started as coming from my story mm. of trying to process Christian faith, sexuality, the LGBTQI plus conversation, and wanting to do a really deep dive. And when I read across like the field of queer theology and I read across just, you know, every mm. the kind of Christian ethics tradition. I didn't find very profound considerations of, 
of what it was like to be a gay celibate Christian in the kind of more modern gloss that I'd stepped into mm -hmm. uh, about three years into my faith where I decided to give that to God, uh, give, give my sexuality to God in that kind of way. But finding that I was experiencing this really intense otherness mm. and this intense queerness that, mm. that I wasn't really very understood everywhere I was going. <laughs> And I wanted to be able to express what that was like in a doctorate and map that yep. intellectually. If it in didn't exist, you had to write it. Yeah, yourself. exactly. And so <laughs> one day I came up with the title Queering the Queer. Which is one stuck. of the best doctorate titles I've ever come across. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I felt, you know, if I can pull this off, you know, <laughs> hopefully, maybe this will be published. That was the hope. <laughs> um, well, well, that so, doctorate yeah. was the, you know, the end but not the end, but the, the latest sort of staging post in, in what has been a really interesting journey that you've been on. Yes. And um, you tell it, obviously, in your 2018 book, A War of Loves. But take us back to childhood growing up. Um, what were the influences on you at the time? Was faith in the picture? Yes. And I guess at what point did you realise you were gay? Yes. So I was raised in an agnostic atheist home. So I remember very much like mocking Christians saying, oh, this is we, we know we're in the 21st century. Let's just move on. on. Yeah. And <laughs> very much surrounded, you know, in Sydney by the LGBTQI plus rights movement and feeling like that was the future. Mm. There was the progressive kind of tipping end of Western civilization of finally finding freedom from all this oppression. And I very much imbibed that as a young person. Um, but at the same time, I had this deep spiritual thirst and I kept kind of trying to find it in Christianity. I went to a liberal church once that didn't quite fit uh, and, and, you know, went through various things like Wicca, Buddhism, trying all sorts of different religions. I even went to a psychic at one stage uh, and she told me I would become a Christian. Oh, wow. well, she got that one right. Yeah, yeah. she did. And I Fair actually enough. was sitting and having coffee with my close friend um, from school who was, you know, who witnessed this mm. whole right. me furious after my tarot card reading. Wow. And uh, she said, well, look at you now, you know, you're, you're more Christian than Christian. And, uh, <laughs> and so there very much was this, this deep, yeah, this deep sense of God's grace in my life. But being controlled by a sense of self-rejection or mm. the, also the rejection of the church and Christians and not really being able to, to surmount that mm. and get over that to then see Jesus, to see the offer of, of God's love in the gospel. And I think I went on a kind of pilgrimage within, you know, I was, I loved post-punk music. I read post-modern uh, <laughs> philosophy. I, hung out in all the alternative suburbs mm, of Sydney when mm. I got a moment uh, out of school and during my first few years of university. So that that's very much how, you know, the context before God comes into my life, mm. at least mm. in my consciousness. Yeah. So what, I mean, it might not be one definitive thing. It might yeah. be like a, a run up, you know, starting yeah. with psychics yeah. and ending <laughs> in QC House in Oxford. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like what changed? Was there a moment or a yeah. few moments that just changed, turned your life upside down? Yeah, there were. And the first one is very much to do with kind of Christian apologetics, fascinatingly. Mm -hmm. So I find myself in a cab one night saying to myself, mm -hmm. I'm really sick of this secular idea of romantic love. Okay. Everyone's running after it. No one can really find it. And if they can, it's so ephemeral. Mm. And I feel like I am Sisyphus pushing this boulder <laughs> up a mountain and then it keeps rolling down. Mm. In every relationship I was having, I went to a Sufjan Stevens concert with a boyfriend and he said, David, you're too profound for me. And I didn't even know Sufjan Stevens was a Christian. Mm. So there was all of this going oh, on. I didn't know he was a Christian. Back, yeah. Is he a Christian? Yeah. Yeah. Of a sort. Should we get him on Reenchanted? Yeah. <laughs> if you can, I'm watching Next that episode. Season. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I ended up having a debate with my uncle at the Christmas lunch table in 2008. Uh, and in my kind of more weary existentialist 
moment, I suppose, where I was kind of weary with atheism and secularism mm. and it wasn't making a lot of sense to me, but I was still defending, you know, the kind of new atheistic ideas, which didn't make a lot of sense with the postmodernism that I right. I believed in. You were holding them all together yeah. in a funny jumble. Exactly. Yeah. And, it, yeah. and it all didn't really make much sense yeah. when I really thought about it, but that this is how the world had to be. And I had to hold that. But deep down, I was so longing for something deeper. And that's why I think I love Augustine, because he's so about that interiority and that mm. right at the heart of all things, you find God in mm. the end, you know. And that was there haunting me, but I, I was repressing it, you know, I think. Mm. And so there I am with my uncle, who's a Pentecostal. He's a white cisgender heterosexual you know middle class man and I'm things. here <laughs> to defeat my enemy my cultural <laughs> enemy and so he mentions God and I say oh yeah sure you know mm. there is no absolute truth and you can't communicate truth with language let alone talk about God it's all ridiculous so just come off it like you know living in the sky with a first century Palestinian Jewish carpenter isn't helping anyone <laughs> you know <laughs> I mean, you know, it's so it's making these kinds of arguments. And he said, well, David, thank you for that. But there's a few problems with what you're saying that you say there is no absolute truth. That's an absolute truth. And you just communicated that with language. So you doubly contradicted yourself. <laughs> And uh, I love the philosophical debates that must have happened around your <laughs> dinner table. On a we have a strong basis. dose of Greek in our family. So <laughs> unlike maybe in British uh, situation, these <laughs> topics are very much live in the family. But yeah, and then, you know, as I kind of have obviously a negative reaction to what he said, although he was very loving towards mm. me, mm. Um, he, he had this kind of vision of God coming into my life um, and the Holy Spirit kind of coming upon me in three months time so and he my said that to you yes oh, okay. no sorry he didn't say that to me he said that to my mother and my oh, aunt okay. and they started to pray for me so they're charismatic christians mm. um and so for me i never knew you know eventually when i do become a christian it didn't make sense to me that some people were like there's no such thing as charismatic i was like is there such thing as charismatic christianity I thought, just, there's just christianity <laughs> right. you know, sure. that didn't make any sense to me mm. because of the nature, the kind of supernatural nature, how God revealed himself to me. And then um, exactly three months later, March 2009, I was in a pub in the gay quarter of Sydney, as Just Justin describes, and and there's a young filmmaker there who's got her film into the largest short film competition in the world. So in my kind of woke before woke was woke <laughs> postmodern worldview, she was like the crowning jewel of my university. And mm. everyone was talking about her. How did she do this at the age of 19? You know, Baz Luhrmann is like mentoring her. Like, wow. it just was, it didn't get better than that. Mm. You know, so I asked her, how did you do this? And she said, well, the real answer is God. And I had a very similar response to <laughs> my uncle's, you know, faith when she yeah. mentioned that. And in that moment, I just remember her having this incredible posture towards me that I'd never seen in a Christian that was so welcoming. And, you know, and I said, well, you know, I'm gay and I've read Romans 1, Leviticus 18, mm. all of these scriptures. And, and she said, wow, I don't even know what I would do if I were you. Was in like mm. I don't I don't I don't have the answer, mm. and then she starts to be kind of touched by the Holy Spirit in front of me in this pub, <laughs> and, and I'm processing all of this, of course, because I'm postmodern. I'm like, ooh, experience, you know, like <laughs> what's happening? You know, is there something there? And yeah, and she said to me, I have one question for you: Have you experienced the love of God? And that question. Mm. It's like I'd been waiting for it all my life, just for someone to ask me that. And it, it pierced through all that background and all of my objections. And just in that moment, I just felt myself drawn to mm. the, the Holy Spirit in her. And there was just this compassion in her. There wasn't this like judgmentalism or, you know. And so she offered me prayer, prayed for me, and then I experience this kind of tingling sensation on the top of my head as she was praying for me and then it's like oil being poured over my head and then yeah this power just through my body and this voice saying to me do you want me um and it was really fascinating to me because i think that's where it goes right to that heart level of 
our desires and mm. our loves. And Thomas Cramner says, you know, until our heart is, you know, transformed, mm. then our, 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 our mind will just justify whatever we want, you know. Mm. Sure, yeah. Mm. And I think that's what definitely was happening with me. Of, you know, a lot of our culture hasn't been touched at that place. Mm. And we're focusing on the mid-level of everything. Yeah. Yeah. And in this moment, it was like the oxygen of God just coming in and me breathing for the first time mm. and just seeing this veil over my heart, like in Corinthians 3 and this pinprick of light kind of coming in as I kind of say yes to this, do you want me question? And then really like having a negative reaction to what was going on because I still had the mind of an atheist gay yeah, activist. Sure. <laughs> and I, to, trying to explain what yeah, that's like is yeah. quite intense. And then um, she kept praying for me and I heard this voice say, will you accept my son Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And I just found myself saying yes. And to my own amazement. Like it was literally like a miracle. Like, how did I say yes? You know, <laughs> but I did, and there was that inner wrestle, and that's why mm. my book that I wrote in two thousand eighteen mm. is called "A War of Loves," mm. because it is this war, a war of two definitions of what love really is. Mm. Yeah. You know, and yeah. I think something about the experience of what happened in that pub has shifted the way I see love quite radically. Mm -hmm to be very much the cross and this idea of a self-giving sacrificial love that isn't it does have a romantic element to it but that's secondary to yeah. this gift this like the way that god gifted himself to me in that pub you know mm. it's something i feel the world needs to know mm. and is so suppressed and not understood in our society and so that i suppose is what i'm really passionate now about trying to communicate to people that might feel condemned by the church who might feel confused by the politics of you know christianity and mm. christendom and just say actually this is what it's really about yeah <laughs> and yeah. that's what the bible says it's really about and come come see you know and it's always the problem i suppose that from the outside, someone looking in will think, well, what Christianity is about these rules and that yeah. chapter in Romans 1 and this <laughs> and, and, and everything else. And I guess for you, it was about stepping into it to realise that obviously mm. you have to, you know, come to terms with, with what all of that means. But it's, that's not what it's ultimately about in that sense. I mean, how did this kind of work out? Because did that sort of experience sustain you enough to kind of, Mm. begin to move into those kinds of questions about, well, what does my life look like now? How am I going to respond? Yeah, I think, you know, even recently I have had wrestles with my faith and particularly the problem of evil and suffering, mm. I think just keeps coming up. <laughs> yeah, mm. But I've come to see that as a beautiful part of the journey of faith is actually the protest to suffering, the like, to discuss that how we as human beings can be so evil to each other. All of that is part of a kind of awakening of your conscience and awakening of what does it really look like to live this love out in the world mm. and to trust God in it, even though you don't fully understand. You know, even with the question of sexuality, which I think I am often known now as saying, well, let's just all relax for a moment. This question is actually not just an ethical question. And I think early on, I treated it as a very moral question. And right. even when I came to the doctrine, I was like, it's all about morality and I need to prove that mm. this is the moral way. Mm. And then as I went deeper into those waters, you know, of, of the question, I came to see that it was very much about suffering and the question of like the odyssey, I think is the fancy mm. philosophy mm. of religion mm. words, mm. which simply yeah. means righteousness and God. Mm. Mm. put together in one word so how can god be good or righteous if god allows these things and i think we need to take a step back as a culture and even in theology and ethics in these fields and really ask how do we approach these kinds of topics and make sure we don't over moralize them and give people the space to wrestle and not just have a formulaic answer to everything mm. Mm. but something that has a dynamic personal element to it so i think that's why i entered into you know christian ethics and 
to the field I did because I just wanted to be able to leave that mark on that field so that the church's articulation of these things could be deeper. And maybe that means we could have more grace for each other as Christians when we disagree without losing our convictions, without having some really strong moral lines in Mm. the sand. Mm. And I think those fluffy answers you often hear in the church can sometimes really aggravate me because they look nice on the surface, but they actually kind of insult that moment of theodicy, Mm -hmm. which we all go through. It doesn't meet you in it and say, yeah, this is really hard. (laughs) Here's the clarity Mm. that we can provide, but we're here to wrestle where Mm. there isn't clarity all the time. And we want to walk with you. And we have, you know, we are human too. We, We have our wrestles with these things too. And we're with you, but we're not going to compromise the deep conviction of what God has revealed because that will lead you to the best place, Mm. you know, the best place of flourishing. So I think that's been my kind of tussle as Mm. I've Mm. gone on. And at one moment, I I really was able through the grace of God to read the Bible without that condemning lens and to see, you know, Romans 1 Mm. and 1 Corinthians 6, 9 as these actually pretty beautiful passages, some of my favorites now, because Mm. they spell the inclusion of people like me in the early church. Whereas before that, in Judaism, it was very hard mm, for mm. someone like myself to enter into covenant with God because the law just, it was just a law. It didn't mm. give you that internal mm. inner life that Jesus now has brought. I mean, there was that for people who were Jewish. They mm. did have that internal life of righteousness and faith, but it wasn't formalized. It wasn't kind of You know, and I think in Christ we see this is the way now, you know, and Mm. affirmed as the way. And that has all sorts of kind of inclusive repercussions, but also a call to even more radical holiness. So what I think I now live in as I've wrestled with that and I've become what's called a side B Christian, which is a celibate gay Christian, or some people in what's called a mixed orientation marriage, that in that tension... We are trying to remain faithful to scriptural teaching, but as it really is. Yeah. Not just is, as some kind of cultural version that you're supposed yeah. to sign up to. You, you want to get to the real heart get to of the, the real issue. thing. And yeah. looking at like Paul, who starts to defend these groups in Romans 1 to, to 3 from the kind of condemnation of people who are more legalistic, mm. and that that's the original mm. message of the gospel. Mm. Yeah. I think you're so generously doing that quite publicly mm-hmm. sitting in that te- in that mm-hmm. tension doing that tussle um that whole radical holiness and radical inclusion i quote that all the time <laughs> <laughs> and so i think people are so drawn to you and to your work um and to a war of loves and and, and every other place where you so generously put your thoughts because you because you refuse the easy answers but also you sit you do that with such grace and such depth and so for anyone who this is their first interaction with you who they Mm -hmm. haven't yet read (laughs) a war of loves can you just sort of slightly more fully explain what it means to be side b why um why you've chosen celibacy but in a way that Mm -hmm. is um in a way that's beyond what they might be thinking it is in a way that gets to the heart as you found it Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Well, I think for me, I entered the scene of the gay Christian world and there was already terminology and there was already Mm. a lot of Mm. work that had been done by other people. Okay. And I I very much felt like I don't want to reinvent the wheel. There's already so much language on this Mm -hmm. Mm. that I want to try to find a way to kind of enter into that. And as I looked at the various discourses, you know, the more side A would be, you know, I affirm that gay marriage could be the will of God for my life at some point. Um, and that can take various forms. Yeah. Um, I was like, no, I'm not convinced of that. I think scriptures do lead to affirming the law as a moral, you know, compass and something that actually does mm. teach us what sin is. That was, you know, that's a hard place to come to. Yeah. But then seeing deep down, I was like, I still understand why people make that choice, you know, mm. and I don't want to cut off relationship with those people. Mm but I also want to stay true to the gospel and the gospel has very intense teaching around, you know, sexual morality. And so, and so 
I think side B is this kind of generous stance to people who disagree on that and saying, well, I understand that you are taking another side A perspective, but I'm going to be still a gay person, still Mm -hmm. identify as gay in some way or same sex attracted is sometimes a term that people feel more comfortable with. And I'm going to have some kind of solidarity with people I disagree with, but I'm also going to clarify that my fellowship is with those who also affirm this and I can still have a form of fellowship with you, but it's not complete. And so that's what I say, like the depth of why side B and Mm -hmm. side A and that paradigm, it still says it's a side. It still says, Mm -hmm. well, this is er irreconcilable (laughs) in some Mm -hmm. sense, but great. Life is full of irreconcilable things. Mm -hmm. Let's learn to love each other through that. Uh, rather than the culture war model that Mm. says let's fight each other and i think originally when side a and side b came out they it wasn't like that it was much Mm. more let's fight each other in a culture war and like try to win yeah and i you still see that sometimes in older generations they'll have this mentality i've got to win the the cause of gay rights in the church or i've got to make sure the church stays faithful to the biblical ethic and that's just exhausting, yeah. you know? So I think that's why I love side A and side B. And I respect that other people don't want to necessarily adopt those terms and have their own stories. But I think it's better to set, step into that and, mm. and show that solidarity to other, you know, LGBTQI plus yeah. people who have faith and try to be a bridge where you can be rather than a cause of division. But I think in holding that, you then end up having a lot of grief as well that you have to process Mm. because you also have to resist the culture war impulse to have your view constantly, you know, vindicated. Mm. Yeah. And that's just so hard. It is. And we we live in a social media age where it's almost impossible, you know, to to escape that because (laughs) everyone wants to turn it into a debate, uh, you know, rather than a relationship. I mean, how do you consciously mm. try to inhabit that place of grace and relationships, even with people where you may come to different conclusions, without it just turning into a she said, he said kind of debate? Yeah. Justin, it's such a good question. I mean, I really feel like I'm only just scratching the surface of this. But I think friendship has to be at the heart of it. When you sit down with someone and you share a meal, and you see their humanity and you, you know, there's something that's unlocked in you that even though you so disagree and it's so important and fundamental, you're able to somehow move through that to, to love them. And they, you know, in some of the friendships I've built with side A people, they actually will be really honest with me and say, you know, you make me want to be side B and, <laughs> and <laughs> say sometimes, yeah, sometimes. I don't know if I would say that exactly because I just feel like I was there in my story. Mm. You know, I've been there and I've kind of died to because that world. Because that was your perspective, I think, early on in your Christian journey, yeah, wasn't it? it? Was, you, you were definitely. going to a, a church that essentially affirmed, mm. you know, um, active say, same-sex relationships and so on. Um, you obviously over the course of time came to believe actually, mm-hmm. no, that isn't where I can stand in, mm-hmm. in good faith and, and so on. But what I really appreciate about you is that you don't enter into it in a kind of, I have to demolish the other side. It's, it's, yeah. you're trying, as you say, friendship has to be at the heart of it. Um, and, and I just think there's, there's not enough of that today. Um, yeah. but it's a really difficult tension to exist in because I'm sure you're constantly being pulled by both sides to kind of take a more kind of dogmatic stance in, in some sense or another. Yeah, I, I exactly. And I think the figure of Augustine in my research really helped me. It was like a kind of medicine to my soul. Because, you know, p- figures like theologians like Karl Barth and mm. the whole German tradition was like super dialectical. And, you know, Augustine's not in, he's also dialectical, but he's like, well, there's a tension here. There's the city of God and the city of earth. And we've, we're living in the, in the in between. Mm. And that's okay. But remain faithful to the love of God in your, your life within that tension and that really helped me like gave a grammar and I think that's why Augustine's having a resurgence at the moment Mm. because a lot of people are finding themselves in the tension Christians are finding they're actually not that Christian 
and secular people finding they're actually not that secular. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a you really know? interesting way of putting it. Yeah. 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 And that, I have so many questions. I'm going to start with this one. Um, so what has, because I think your work and, and, and your wisdom is so much to do with what does, what has your relationship with Jesus, the love mm. of God, what has that taught you mm-hmm. about your identity, part of that being your sexual identity, mm-hmm. your sexuality? Like how has that, how does the love of God frame that for you? What I think I've learned through the love of God is there is this universal, non-sexual eros. I suppose it's, if I'm going to it's a, it's a difficult word in our culture, but I'm going to mm. use it intention, intentionally. It's like a passionate longing for union with the other yeah. is how I would define mm. it. Mm. Which is so often put in the romantic box. Yeah, It's so, really weird that it's taken out of that and box. all these people who can't have romantic relationships in our society are just thrown off as mm. like, you know, refuse on the waste heap of history, the you'll, you'll evolutionary, that. Yeah. The evolutionary yeah. dead ends that aren't, <laughs> you know, don't have any utilitarian value. Let's <laughs> yeah. really go there, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. why not? And, and, you know, they're just this, but th- this idea that actually at the heart of the existence of the world is this love, this union, this desires union with you mm. and with the whole world and all the goodness in the world. Like, that's the best news ever. And that while my eros as a human might be all over the place and, you know, one of the earliest church fathers, Ignatius of Antioch, he says, my eros must be crucified. And then Charles Williams at Oxford said, only so that it can be raised <laughs> wow. from the dead. Like, mm. I love that. Yeah. Mm. Our culture is looking for mm. eros that has been resurrected. And so I think I'm like, how do we show, show the world what that eros looks like that is perfected by agape, by the self-sacrificial love of Jesus mm. in us. Mm. So that you have our ascending love coming and touching the descending love of God. And in that is this kind of union of, mm. of, of desire and longing, like satisfied, you know? Mm. And I think we've looked at sex in our culture as like that place to find mm. that completion because it was designed as a sacrament or as a sign mm-hmm. of that deeper reality. Mm. But Augustine also says, don't privilege the sign over the, what is being signified by the sign. And I love that too, you yeah. know. So I'm trying to privilege that by being a celibate person. I'm saying, no, there is this greater love for all people and it's universal and you don't have to be married and you don't have to have sex and you can be an evolutionary dead end and you have, <laughs> you, you matter, you know? And I think that's also another thing about being queer or gay is you are an evolutionary dead end. Like you're not passing on your genes. You're not part of natural selection. Mm. You might have this weird indirect mimetic influence on the evolutionary process, but who wants that? You know, <laughs> like I have been told from a young age by secular humanistic evolutionary thinking, you don't really have a purpose. Mm. Interesting. And it was only when I found God, it was like, no, as a gay and queer person, everything matters. Everything is loved. Mm. <laughs> and I was at Cambridge University recently listening to a lecture on Maximus the Confessor. And he says, everything is originally from the one and is a like reflection outward of like this one logos, this like idea of like an ordering principle. So that even the things that don't have any purpose like those animals that never became a new species or <laughs> queer people or disabled people or mm. poor people, <laughs> whatever the yeah. category is, they all have this inalien- like inalienable value because mm. they all come from this one mm. Mm. and then everything will return to God like that. And that's become a really beautiful picture for me of like the value and purpose of the world. And it's given me so much hope and it's mm. re-enchanted the way I see everything. I mean, you're kind of, it, it sounds amazing, but you, I'm sure yeah. on a daily basis, you're fighting against kind of the whole world, kind of sending you a completely different message, yes. which is, it is all about the physical fulfillment of Eros in this life. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and of course, you know, we, we are bombarded through Hollywood, social mm-hmm. media, everything that, that this is the purpose. This is where, you know, 
Um, so how do you kind of at a very practical level deal yeah. with that in your own life? You know, it's, <laughs> it's wonderful to have the kind of the highfalutin mm. theology, if you like. But uh, what, yeah. what does that look like when Not you're just like, a symphony. my yeah. social media feed <laughs> yeah. just screams at me, you're strange, David, basically. Yeah. <laughs> and also the... Also, the church does that as well. Yeah, to be yeah, fit, in that, you know, there's lots of, um, I think Louise Perry and Mary Harrington and people like that is, you know, mm-hmm. talking about how marriage is being devalued. And I'm like, why doesn't it feel like that in a church group? Yeah. You know, yeah, it's yeah. still the ultimate goal. So I think there's a difference between marriage that is integrated into that picture that I've described. And that's such a beautiful thing and something we want people to engage in. It's not a bad thing. But. Mm. But marriage that's separated from that picture becomes a kind of God sex. Mm. Mm. So what I'm what I'm trying to simply say, if I can boil it down, is simply that sex is only one small part of this human desire and longing. And we've, we it, when we dissect it and make it the whole picture, we're we're making a lot, of, you know, a huge mistake. Mm. Sure, that's actually yeah. damaging our human society and culture. And I don't think you have to be a Christian to affirm that. Right. I, f- I think a lot of people who aren't Christian would say, oh yeah, I know. Tell me about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you yeah. know, in their yeah. own personal experience. And so I suppose for me in the nitty gritty practical outworking of that, it would mean having friendships that really go into this deeper place yeah. of learning safe affection, safe, safe, you know, interactions where your eros has been sanctified and has has been kind of rechanneled in a good way mm-hmm. and i think that's my next question really mm. for my research is how do you do that yep. mm. and there's a whole lot of psychological literature a lot of pondering about that in a secular world that you know and there's been a strong teaching in psychology it's not possible just just to follow your desires as long as they don't harm anyone i guess singleness has you know historically in the church mm-hmm. has has been in some sense celebrated as a vocation you know it, but it does as, as bell alluded to feel like a lot of churches mm-hmm. now just it's like about well we just have to get you on this marriage track we have to get you on this you know <laughs> this is somehow the so i guess you you've mm. very much sort of wanted to put mm. the value of singleness and celibacy as a gift mm-hmm. back in the, the church's sites how is it doing? Is it is it working? What what could the church be doing a lot better right now in in that respect? Yeah, sometimes I feel like Saint Anthony in the cave with the Aryans outside. You know, <laughs> oh, no. oh, dramatic. No, um, no, it's not that bad. Um, I think honestly, it comes back down to just really ordinary human life, mm-hmm. friends, you know, meals at tables. Uh, tax, <laughs> all the things that we don't think about, you know, these all matter. They're all part of this mm. economy that I'm talking about, mm. you know, whatever it looks like, this, these moments of sacrifice in our lives where we give, we give up something else for someone else, you know, whether you're a parent or I think that's so important that we don't lose sight of the fact that love requires a sacrifice. You know, even when we're talking about the environment, we actually have to give something up. Mm-hmm. for the world to be a place that isn't you know destroyed for the next generation you know there are all these skills in the church's tradition of celibacy that can actually help the world have a healthy version of that self-denial that asceticism giving yourself up for a greater good whatever that looks like and that i think as christians we need to dig deep into our tradition and we also need to live it out mm. we need to be celibate in the way that Christians have been and learn from that. We have 2,000 years of history mm. and wisdom that is sitting there and a lot of baggage too and a lot of situations say that really didn't work. Why? And the church, I'm trying to encourage the church to do that. Yeah. But unfortunately, the church seems to be wanting to avoid anything to do with celibacy because it's it's perceived in a certain way on a popular level as what has caused, you know, sexual abuse crises right. of these things. But actually, when you question that popular level, more superficial belief, no, it's that's not what causes abuse. The yeah. inner disorder, lovelessness, 
Mm. sinfulness whatever you want to kind of call it within us as humans is what causes that you can be married and that doesn't have any effect on your desire to you know do something horrible to someone else yeah the idea that marriage solves the problem of a kind of inner abusive disorder desire (laughs) is kind of crazy when you think about it and actually that does bear out when you look at it more deeply it's not celibacy that causes that so i think that's a misdiagnosis And I think what I also find fascinating is when you go back throughout history, looking at a lot of the philosophers, they were all saying, you know, sex actually gets in the way a lot of the time of a healthy eros. (laughs) Sex can be part of a healthy Mm, eros, mm. but most of the time it gets in the way of it. And you've got to learn how to rechannel that desire so it becomes something that actually loves someone else, sacrifices for someone else, doesn't just take isn't just selfish Mm. so i don't want to get rid of the pleasure and the joy and the delight but i don't want that to become you know the whole schema we need Mm -hmm. to make sure that is happening so that we have healthy relationships and i feel like as a christian i don't have to make someone else a christian to see that i think that is something that's evident whatever your worldview Mm. yeah because there's pleasure and joy and delight in singleness yeah we're just really bad at spotting it I'm yes. celebrating it. And like, so for example, one thing I always think is if you're a single person, you just don't get celebrated very much because you haven't got your uh, engagement party, your That's Hindu, why I got your wedding. consecrated recently. I, oh, yeah. tell us about yeah, that. Yeah, tell us about that. What, what was that then? Yeah, well, I was watching an Instagram video of an Austrian, a lay Catholic lady hmm. uh, called Bernadette Lang. And she in Salzburg Cathedral, I was watching this video and she's in this huge, beautiful white wedding dress, like something out of the sound of music. Nice. <laughs> and, then, and then you think, where's, where's the bridegroom? You're kind of looking around the cathedral yeah. and there was no bridegroom. Okay. It was just a bishop who like lifts his hands and then she just like prays over her. And then she's like on the grounds street before god like giving her life to jesus and i just broke into tears i was like that is so beautiful Mm. and a very visual idea of the bride of christ quite literally yeah Yeah. and you know catholicism which is not necessarily my tradition in every way seeing that in my my sister and being like wow what a Mm. witness i want how could i do that in a kind of reformed anglican whatever (laughs) you want to call it way and uh and then I, I wrote to my friend N.T. Wright and said, what do you think about consecrating me to celibacy? If you're going to get anyone to do it, it may as well Basically, be N.T. Wright. Yeah, Jesus yeah. is going to put a ring on it. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, let me check my diary. That was a good impression. <laughs> and, and he had the weekend free and it was right on my graduation and my, you know, on that day after I'd written a doctorate about celibacy I was able to actually put that into practice and mm. to really experience that nuptial romance it, of God. I mean, I love the Beyonce reference. I don't know if N.T. Wright got it, but the... <laughs> no, no. the, the I'm but always trying. It's, no. it's about like, yeah, but literally you've put a ring on it. Yeah, you said, like, I'm yeah. devoted to Jesus. This is, this is kind of, mm. you know, where it's at. And I think, I think what I am really challenged by your story in your life is that, as you say, Christians sometimes settle for less than that. And they kind of substitute their Mm -hmm. physical relationships for what is that? We're actually being called to something much deeper. And we forget that Jesus was a single man, for goodness sake, you know. Yes. Uh, It's like the the person that we're supposed to model our life after most did not have a partner. So so it's kind of like, I find your... I find you so challenging in that mm-hmm. sense, David, because whenever I read your social media, which is often kind of you experiencing something quite big and difficult um, because you're, you're kind of, you, you put it out there, you know, yeah. you the ups and downs. But I, I love the way it always comes back to challenging me to say, mm. am I really at the, you know, experiencing what God really has for me or am I substituting other things for that? Yeah. And, and Justin, I think for me, it comes from being the, basically the same kind of human as you are (laughs) you know a lot of what i'm saying is often preaching to myself yeah Mm. you know out there it's a kind of whatever i feel i'm preaching to myself i'll say 
is that a private preaching or a personal preaching? <laughs> sometimes I maybe get the distinction not quite right, <laughs> but I try to. And sometimes I feel like, no, this is a personal thing that I think will help other people mm. to recalibrate their heart and reorder their loves. And so that's the hope mm. is that I could live a life that might help people do that um, and, and find a deeper love mm. that will animate their life. And I think, you know, I wasn't looking for God, but I was looking for love. And I found out that God was love. And so that's it. You know, I feel, feel very much like I'm a kind of, in a positive sense, a slave <laughs> yeah. to that love. I can't mm. escape it. I can't leave it. Even when I want to, even when I'm struggling and wrestling mm. and I look at all the biblical authors, how they communicate their lives. And it's so like that. It's yeah. mm-hmm. a beautifully ordered mess. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's why people struggle with the Bible because they say, well, how do I understand this? It's not all nice and neat and ordered. Mm. It's like, well, yes, it is ordered. There is an order, but it takes patience to find it. And I do continually find that beauty and that order in God's word and in, in, the, in the ways of God. And I think it has such a power to, to, re, yeah, to re-enchant our culture. And I'm really... I'm always hoping and praying that more witnesses to that will stand up and be counted. Mm. And so that's why I love your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we love having you on. Yeah. yeah, I think so. just one final question, which you've mm-hmm. answered again and again and again throughout this whole thing. But if anyone is watching this and they're not a Christian, but they are a part of the LGBT yeah. AI community, yes. is Christianity good news for them? That's such a good question. I think if you adopt the categories of our culture, the gospel doesn't look like good news for us Mm. as LGBTQI plus people. But I think if you have the patience to look a little deeper, to kind of trust that maybe God might be there and maybe all that pain you felt in trying to wrestle with this topic and with the church and Christians and, you know, they failed you. If you can pierce a little deeper, I think it absolutely is the most fantastic news Mm -hmm. because the reality was, as I said, you know, in the moral law of God, there was no way for gay or queer people, LGBTQI plus people, but the New Testament is full of people like the eunuch Mm -hmm. becoming the like foremost sign of new creation in Acts 8. The eunuchs were kind of, didn't fit in the binary of male and female, Mm -hmm. you know, you had women lifted up, you had all the poor and the oppressed, you know, mm. being given this good news. And that good news is for us too, <laughs> so mm. deeply for mm. us. And I have found as I followed God and given my life to him as an LGBTQI plus person, God hasn't decreased my queerness. He's increased it. <laughs> It just looks different to what I expect. He's queered the queer. He's queered the queer. It's a great year. And so I don't feel any need to repress that or reshape yeah. that, I think. But it looks different to what secular LGBTQI plus people maybe are expecting. But I think... Because even, is... even the LGBT movement can have a kind of a script, you know. It's like yeah. you, you can be queer, but you have to be queer on these terms kind of thing. And it's an extremely heterosexist script when I think about it. Because right. it's saying, say you're exactly like heterosexual people and marriage is the only way. And, you know, everything that mm. we was used to oppress us, we are adopting in some kinds of ways. Not everything, but this kind of essential belief that yeah. sex and marriage is the only way to flourish. So if you can take anything from this, it's that there really is a way there if you want it and no one can take that from you. It's a free gift by faith. Uh, And that has been such a source of solace. And that love that I experience is what has held me even when it's really hard and Mm. I am misunderstood and I am rejected in some of the ways that I feared I would be if I became Christian. I just hold on Mm. to Jesus, to the love of Jesus and try to live out the fear of God, which just means the awe-inspired respect of who God is in everything I do. And as I keep doing that, I find it's just wonderful news. Mm. And and I suppose it takes a bravery and it takes a trust that it's all going to be okay in the end. (laughs) (laughs) And I think it, 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 and and so it's not a life of repression. It's not self-hating, abnegation underneath. I think it can be when it's lived out badly and in the wrong way, but it really is when you live 
mm. in alignment with God's heart, it's just, it's yeah. the best. It brings me so much joy. Yeah. And that's what's yeah. the paradox in all of this is like, you're celibate, but you have joy. Yeah. You know, mm. It's not all Bridget Jones's diary. <laughs> as much as I love Bridget Jones, it's also the holiday sometimes. <laughs> hey, I, I hope this doesn't sound super patronizing, because it could, but I, I sometimes feel like what you're going on is a kind of like, you're getting there before others in terms of what we are all promised, that union with Christ. Because actually Jesus says there's going to be no marriage, no giving of yeah. you know, people in, in that kingdom. It's going to be the real thing, you know, the union with Christ that this is just a, a sign of. But I almost yes. feel like your journey is sort of saying, well, I'm going to have to get there a bit quicker than you guys kind of mm. thing. Do you start, know the, what I mean? start the party early. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, get, get the Beyonce record before it's been released. <laughs> um, no, yeah, I think absolutely, Justin. I think that's a beautiful way of putting it, of what celibacy is about is a marriage. It's just not, Yeah. it's not the kind of marriage we have on in this mm. existence. It's a mystical, beautiful, universal marriage mm. between heaven and earth, God and humanity, the church and Jesus, and it can't be stopped and it's coming. Mm. And yeah, we get to start the party early. And I do feel like with, I feel the same way with Christian couples that really understand what scripture is saying, like loving your spouse as Jesus, you know, Jesus died for the church. Yeah. If you understand that and live that out for, towards each other, you're also starting the party early. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think, again, it comes back to this, the way to human flourishing is first to go downward. It's first to descend. And then mm. to mm. ascend. And I think that's what my next book's going to be okay. about. It's going to be called Love's Ascent. It's about the downward movement of God's love in Jesus becoming human. Mm. And then that how that raises the world into resurrection. And so our way of entering mm. human flourishing must first be like a downward move of self-denial and humility mm. and mm. giving up ourselves, whether it's marriage or celibacy. And then that movement upward into resurrection. Mm. And on this podcast, you're asking a question, can that re-enchant the world again? Absolutely. In fact, I think it's a the way <laughs> to yeah, do that. Yeah. I really am That's convinced good. of that. So, yeah. yeah. I reckon when we called our podcast Reenchant, and there were people who were like, well, then when are you getting David Bennett? Because <laughs> <laughs> like, that is just what you do. You just, you just re-enchant everything. And you, you have this like beautiful way of like challenging but also comforting at the same time like you diagnose and prescribe <laughs> at the same time and that's so rare and so mm. valuable um and you've done it mm. here today but you do it all over the place so if if you haven't if this is your first uh, interaction with david bennett there's lots more yeah. to find yeah. find thank find find more from david in, in the links yeah. with today's thank show you so um, much. thank you so much for spending some time with us thank you for having me it's been wonderful thank you guys <laughs>